reading from our epistle text. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are a people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. One of the beautiful things about being a liturgical church body is that we follow a lectionary. It gives us readings and follows us through the life of Christ. So as you know, so far we've been through Advent, the prophecy of Christ to come, and then finally John the Baptist and Elizabeth and Mary. When John the Baptist and Christ leapt in the womb, and then John the Baptist pointing that Christ is to come, and then of course the glorious Christmas when Christ is born. And here now we are in Epiphany, as you very well know, have gone through the wedding of Cana and continue through this Epiphany season. Then we have to ask, what in the world is our gospel text doing in Epiphany? Where is the Messiah in the Epiphany other than Him speaking? That's what the Epiphany is, as you've heard me say, this entire season. Every miracle is an, is an epiphany, showing who Christ is, pointing to Christ. But in our gospel text, in our lectionary, where we have an Old Testament reading, an epistle reading, and a holy gospel reading, as well as the psalm and, uh, and etc., the colic, etc. But here, in our gospel text, we find Christ not necessarily being the epiphany, but speaking the epiphany. Which is wonderful because you can't separate Christ from the one who is speaking. You can't separate the words of Christ from Christ who speaks them. But let's back up. Since we have this wonderful lectionary, let's back up and take a look at our epistle text. Because in our epistle text, we find much, much comfort. So much comfort, in fact, that when we read these words, our breast should be, uh, should be so full of joy that we cannot hope to contain it. Why, then, did you come to church? Why are you here? I think that that question needs to be asked. And you need to ask that question of yourself. Why come to church? And I know that we have quite a few people out with the flu. But still, why come to church? What's the point in coming to church. And our epistle tells us that very thing. Because it asks the question, what if, with the knowledge of what is? What if Christ had not been raised from the dead? Then me standing here preaching is of no avail. You coming to church is of no avail. It doesn't matter. If there's no resurrection of the dead, and then not even Christ has been raised, then what hope do we have? Why come to church if there is no hope? I, mean, I, I can't think of a reason. We're not a Rotary Club. We're certainly not the Masons. We're not a social gathering that just gathers to be social. Rather, as we were talking about in Sunday school today, we are unified, but in what? 
What are we unified in? Do we salute the flag in the same unity that we bow at the foot of the cross? Well, if Christ has not been raised, we might as well. But as it is, again, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that has raised Christ. Whom, he did, whom if he did not raise, if it is true, then the dead are not raised. For the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Now I want you to take that verse right there and understand its implications. If Christ has not raised from the dead, you are damned. That's it. As my dad was known to say, there's no pass and go. There's no collecting $200. <coughs> That's a monopoly, <coughs> by the way. And so... When I ask you in particular why you come to church, why you came to church today, the answer has to be this. Because I believe and know my Savior has been raised from the dead. Because if He has not, then all of this is worthless. But as it is, it's the same Christ who, hangs for, who hung from the cross was buried and was raised from the dead. And because He is raised from the dead, all of those who have died since and all of those who will die in the future shall too be raised from the dead. You see, here's the, here's the thing. Christ's resurrection is the linchpin for all of our faith. Those who have gone before us, those who sit here, and we who will eventually die, the linchpin is Christ Jesus and His resurrection. The cross of Christ forgives our sins. The resurrection of Christ gives us the promise and the hope. And in this text, in this 1 Corinthians text, we find these words. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ and He had not been raised, we are all a people most to be pitied. There are many false gods out there and there are many idols that we fall into. And anything that you can say that you love above God is an idol. What you spend your time doing in and, of, uh, in and above reading Scripture, coming to service, receiving the Lord's Supper, is your idol. Anything that you place in front of coming to church to learn Bible study, Wednesdays for youth and adults, anything that we put above and beyond our Lord is an idol. But here's the thing. The resurrection of Christ breaks down all of those idols. Splits them in two. Breaks them. Breaks our idols. And brings us to a repentant state where we ask for the forgiveness of sins. And here's the wonder of all wonders. Is that He says yes A perfect Lord has no business forgiving our sins. But He doesn't. He doesn't owe us a thing. He doesn't owe us anything. We owe Him everything. And then we have the great reversal where He gives us everything and we give Him nothing. And all that's left at the end of the day is this. 
Alleluia. Christ is risen. That's at the end of the day. That's all that we have. That's all that we have on the tip of our tongues and on our lips is to confess and receive Christ. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay that at the end of the day when my, die, when my time of dying comes, that my, on my lips, having done nothing to garner my own salvation, I may say, Alleluia. The bonds from this life have been released. I look forward to that day. That might be weird. But I look forward to that day when my eyes close in death so that they would be open to see my Savior. What are you doing here in church? It's because you believe that this is true. And so then, from this text, we move in understanding that if Christ had not raised from the dead, all goes to hell. All is damned. But as it is, Christ says these words to us. Blessed are you, you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry now. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. That's Christ speaking to His disciples, but also to you. Blessed are you now, for you are poor. Blessed are you now, for you are hungry. Blessed are you who weep for those who have gone before you and those who will go in the future. Weep for those. Weep for yourselves. Blessed are those when people hate you, and certainly they do. But, but, for you poor, hungry, weeping people who hate you, understand this. The kingdom of God is yours. You who hunger shall be satisfied. And you shall laugh, those who now weep. And when those exclude you and hate you, remember this. This is the hardest thing to take with you. They hate you because they hated Christ first. So take this with you. While you've come to church to hear these words and to eat His flesh and drink His blood, take this with you as well. When you walk out those doors, you're walking into a world who hates you. So do this. Smile. Smile and be glad. Because the same Savior knows that you weep and that you mourn, and that you're hungry, and that you're poor. And He has, in return, given everything over. His own flesh to eat, His own blood to drink, the riches in baptism. And He has lifted your eyes into heaven, saying, Behold, I am raised from the dead, and so shall you. Amen and amen.